Man, the presence of the Lord has just been uh, awesome. He is awesome, isn't he? And um, so thankful for who he is and uh, just your hearts. Um, you know, it's beautiful just to be among a people who uh, are hungry for the Lord. And what a first stop for me in the beginning of a new year to come here. And I was so looking forward to it because of you folks and uh and just uh, knowing and, and and witnessing it now, the the deposit of the Lord, you know, God is uh, always uh, on the increase of Himself. There's always the uh, the dynamic of His increase, our decrease. It, that in itself is a a cycle, isn't it? And uh, uh, new seasons of the Lord and new deposit, fresh deposit. Of the Lord, and and uh, that I think we're in one of those moments. Don't can't you feel that in your hearts and see that in the spirit? We're in one of those moments of uh, the just. It's meant to be this way: the fresh deposit of the Lord to us and uh, and through us, to us and through us. I like that cycle as well, don't you? To us and through us, and the the Holy Spirit. Because of your hearts, I'm just going to bear mind for a second here what I was seeing, have been seeing, witnessing since I've been here, and again tonight, just uh, that deposit of travail among you, and that's been my heart's cry before the Lord that uh, I just know this, uh, we're vessels, all of us, and we need the Lord working with us what it said in the scripture, to do what needs to be done. It's impossibility for a man, I mean that, uh, again, ladies, not in a gender way, mankind, to do only what God can do. We can be vessels, all of us, and, and we must be. But the demand is the release of the Lord and the release of travail. And so that is taking place. I had to tell you something. You know, you're being given larger wings. I saw that in the spirit. I won't try to go in all to all the interpretation of that so much as just to say you're being given larger wings. Of course that's in the spirit, but it's it's dealing with not just it begins first there, the receiving, but the aspect of the giving and the release of the Lord through you. Larger wings does have a dynamic of enlargement of sphere and effect. So just want to say that um, I saw something tonight, Brad, as well, that you could, I'm sure you guys could feel it like I, I could. There was a break, like a punch breakthrough type thing that occurred. And whatever, you know, you guys are contending with and, We'll get into all that, but you're contending. You guys know that. You're contending for the Lord's full purpose. And that tonight there was a punch that made it through in the heavens, that resistance. I could see it. I could see the light of it. So, and what it established, though, this is what was interesting, what first appeared to be a, a ray of blue light became a ladder as I watched it. And uh, it's about that that giving of the Lord, and that uh, receiving of Him, and that that goes back up to Him, and then that that goes out uh, from Him through us. So I just thought I'd take a few seconds and just share that, what I was seeing tonight. And um, I do not believe in exaggeration. If we're going to share things, we need to be as precise as possible. And just share what we see. Sometimes we have understanding, and sometimes this is true of these things. God will give us greater understanding as we wait upon Him. God is the interpreter. Daniel knew that, didn't he? Said it directly to Nebuchadnezzar. God, God alone understands mysteries. He's the great interpreter, and uh, we have to wait on Him for that, don't we? So. Uh, I'm not much, I'm just going to tell you this, I'm not much on books that tell you how to interpret things. And you know why I'm not? Because of what I just said. Daniel understood. God understands mysteries. 
He's the great interpreter. It may mean this in this context. I've seen that. That does not mean it means this in this context. <laughs> the same exact thing. I've just, how many have seen that? I have over and over. I, and the Lord told me, he said, I want you dependent upon me in this. Don't assume on this. I want you, it, God loves relationship. He's not interested, if I could just say this to us, he's not interested in us going alone. <laughs> <laughs> that's not why he wants a bride so she can go at it alone <laughs> anyway enough of that let's get to the point of this tonight again and uh, we're going we're gonna to start um, with some passages um, in uh, Romans and then in Corinthians a little bit tonight just start there there's a number of things um, I want to continue with and what we've been sharing and but I want to. I want to uh, begin. I, I want to say something about these four books that I've been talking about, particularly um, dealing with uh, the book of Daniel. <clears throat> but and no less wise, uh, Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah, or what was in the Hebrew Bible, uh, Ezra two was what Nehemiah was called. They saw that in one context. Even though it covered a number of years, that's how they looked at that. And, but let's begin tonight in Romans chapter 15, and we're going to read verse number 4. Um, we know this, but it needs to be said. Uh, God would not have books written and preserve those books if it only dealt with the time frame of those who uh, were alive when those books were written. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and the scripture speaks to that, and we'll look at that in verse 4 here. For Here's what Paul has to say about it. And Paul knew those 39 books of the Old Testament very, very well, didn't he? He was an expert in those books. and I knew the books very well. He just didn't know the Lord. That's what happens in Judaism or any religion. It's what happened on the progression of things. They had the law, they had the books, they didn't have the Lord. My point in that is that we come to the same place in modern Christianity. We have the books of the Bible and we have our traditions and we have our Christian law and we have everything but the Lord, it seems to me. And I'm being general when I say that. I'm not trying to be critical. Well, Paul understands something after the Lord Jesus encounters him and sets him on an entirely other than course, the right one. He puts him in the way, the truth, and the life, Christ. <laughs> and all that Paul formerly was, he considered as dung to the surpassing greatness of of knowing Christ. That's how Paul saw it. And so must we. If God is going to lead us out of the normalcy of Christian culture into the fullness of his heart and burden and purpose, there is going to be a considering of all that was former as dung to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. That's where we're headed, isn't it? That's, that's really what we're coming out to. We're not coming out to just another culture. We're not coming out to another just expression of things. We're coming out to the Lord that he might have his full expression in his bride. Think about it for a moment. Think of this in the eternities of, etern of eternities. God has never had a creation that expressed his glory. I'm not talking about in praise. I'm talking about in life. Their nature was an expression of the glory of his own nature. And, and hear me when I say this to us. It's important to God that he have that. Here's one of the reasons. It's not the only reason, but it's a primary reason. 
for the rest of his creation to truly have the opportunity to know his nature. And let's just say it this way. He that dwells in unapproachable light. That's the creator-created relationship. To move them beyond the creator-created relationship would take a vessel that had been created but was moved by divine purpose into a relationship of union. Now sharers of that very life nature. And through that bride, he would show all that is created his glory through his bride. His own nature would be expressed. We are that new creation. We are that bride if we want to be. By invitation. So I just want to bring that out. Well, let's get to verse 4 before I just go down that path alone. But I just want us to keep that in mind. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful intent of God? Okay, so verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach who? Us. Where did Paul hear that? There's only one place you can hear that from. <laughs> the Lord. Yes. Moses didn't know that. Not when he is on this earth. He does now. But not when he was on this earth. He didn't understand that. No one, if you look back through the history of this, would have understood, understood what Paul comes to understand but let me just say this, and you search this out. But Paul saw the Lord in a way that up to that point no one else had ever seen before either. But in saying that, I want to say something to us. But what Paul represents in his relationship with the Lord is what God has meant for the whole of his bride to be. Only increase that. <laughs> but we've idolized Paul without seeing he merely represents the intent of God for his bride. That she properly understand everything that has happened in God's history with man. For God to bring us to the final focal point of relationship called union, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Notice the language. Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's the glory I was talking about a moment ago. A vessel that has the exact same glorious, magnificent, amazing, wondrous nature of God himself. In fact, it is God's own nature in her. doesn't make her a God. makes her a vessel <laughs> of the one true living one be heretical to, well, we've become fourth part of the Trinity. That would be heresy. No. We have the one true lamb living in us and his nature. So I want to be clear. So anyway, Paul sees something. And uh, how would you like to be Paul? I just want to say this to you for a second. How would you like to be Paul and have revelation that has no previous foundation to it? No witness. How would you like to stand in that day to the whole of the Jewish nation who are saying, we've got Moses, and we've got Abraham, we've got the law. Paul looks at them and says, and I've got Christ, and you guys are dead wrong. <laughs> in what way are we wrong? You've lost, you got lost in your traditions about the coming one. And you missed his coming. How would you like to have that kind of revelation? When it reads good, but live it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I can see in your eyes right now, I'm challenging, challenging many of you. Challenging, challenging our doctrines. Challenge, because that's where Paul stood, and that's where we're going to stand if we let the Lord take us on in this. 
to come to know the Lord. We stand on the solitary ground of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it sets itself up against everything else that claims to be the knowledge of God. That's amazing. You read what Paul said about it. We take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. God's in a confrontation with everything else that is claiming godliness outside the only way of godliness, Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. There is no other way. Listen, now let me say something to you. You don't have your own relationship with God outside of Christ. I'm going to say that to you again. You do not have your own relationship with God the Father outside of Christ. I'll tell you what we have. We have the relationship that Christ has eternally had with his Father. That's what we've been brought into. And let me tell you about the love involved in that. How does God the Father love us then the same way he has eternally loved his Son? Who is in you and you are in him. Now put that back in Satan's pipe and make him smoke it. Next time he tells you God doesn't love you. God doesn't love you. God doesn't love his son. Who's in you? Is that not true, Brad? That's John 17. Read it. That's what's being said there. So we don't have, you know, a separate relationship with the Father. Christ has his over here. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. And we've been brought into that eternal relationship. Isn't that beautiful? Now we could dance around the church just over that. I didn't got, <laughs> we could stop right here. I just want to say that to us, the beauty of that. God has made his bride to be a vessel of his presence, of his life, of his glory. She is filled as a vessel is filled with the Lord. He is her life. She is living by the life of another. And that another is the Lord himself living in her. The one is living in the many. And the many are living by the life of the one. That's his body. That's his house. He's used a different language for this. His body, his house, his temple, his bride. Well, anyway, so Paul understands. I just want to say something to us about the Apostle Paul for a second. He had revelation that had never been given to anyone else. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it, Brad? Preach is wonderful. But when you're the one standing, even against some of the other apostles, because they still got the grave clothes on. Peter still had his grave clothes on of being a Jew. Paul had to rebuke him to his face at Antioch. You read it in Galatians. Because it's not about Judaism. It's not about being a Gentile. It's about having Christ in you. A new creation. And Adam can't touch it. <laughs> and that's all the Jews and the Gentiles are. They're of Adam. But you're not. You're what your bloodline was. You're a new creation. And therein is the great emancipation. And the great distinction. Is that not beautiful? So it don't matter about the color of your skin. Doesn't matter about who your mom and daddy was. Doesn't matter about the history through your bloodline. It matters about Christ. It's Christ in you. That's what makes us one. There's no division in Christ's body. You cannot drag Adam over into Christ. You can't bring him through the cross because the cross is the what is it? It is the circumcision of the flesh. And I'm not going to be nasty. I'm going to tell you this. Why circumcision? Circumcision so that the one true head may appear. That's why. That's the picture. Amen. That's what God's talking about. That's what he's always been talking about. 
So that's a gospel you can go anywhere in the world and preach the same gospel because God loves people all the same. It's no favoritism. How many times that said in your New Testament? Thirteen times. There's no favoritism. Amen. What a gospel. Now that's glorious, isn't it? And we're about to see that apostolic gospel be given, offered back to the church, be given back to God's people. And I'm saying yes and amen. How about you? But anyway, back to Paul. So Paul sees something here. Let's read it again. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So when we look at the book of Daniel, and we look at the book of Esther, and we look at the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and we look at Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi and any other book of the Old Testament, when we look at those books, it's not just speaking, oh, to that time and forget it. No, no, the Lord who has given us these books has given, us, given them to us for our times as well to teach us. Amen. Now, I don't have time to go into all of this, but you can see that again in 1 Corinthians. I, I do want to look at a little bit of it. I don't want to look at the whole chapter, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul's going to say <clears throat> the same thing to us again. Verse, or chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 1, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. Did they understand that? No. Because now Paul's, here's what we must understand through the Scriptures, that we've been given an entirely new set of glasses to read the Scriptures. And those glasses are called Christ in you. And this isn't Paul just taking advantage of people and saying things he wants to say. This is the revelation of Christ operating in a person who rightly interprets the events that the Holy Spirit put in the Scriptures to testify of who? Christ. Because the Holy Spirit, just what Jesus said about him, when he comes, he's only going to speak of me. That's what he's always been doing. And he happened to be the one who inspired all of these books. Tell me he wasn't testifying about Jesus. He has forever been testifying about Jesus. That's, and Paul understand that. And you'll, we'll understand it too. That's not just someone special. That's the revelation of Christ. It helps us to understand that every jot and every tittle. Jesus said it in John chapter 5. You search the scriptures. Because you think life is in them. These scriptures testify of me. And you won't come to me. I, I would say that he knew what he was talking about. He's the living word that the written word testifies to. They are true because he is true. That's why they're true. They're the truth because he is the eternal truth. And they point straight to him. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm just laying a foundation before I launch into what I'm going to say tonight. You know it's a setup. <laughs> But it's a good setup, isn't it? It brings us on to the ground of Christ. The church has to be on the ground of Christ. It's the eternal ground. There is not a third thing coming out here. The Lord's coming. But there's not a third thing coming. So you have to understand that. It's not something better than his bride coming. Well, if he can just get his bride in order. <laughs> That's where the marriage supper is about. Recognition of that. Well, anyway, they were all baptized into Moses and in the cloud and into the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food, and they drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. That rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. 
Their bodies were scattered all over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. Now, Paul's, in all of that Paul writes, Paul's not trying to give us a new written law of do's and don'ts. But he is saying this, and it's important for us to hear this, that the two natures are clearly distinct. The nature of Adam is completely other than the nature of Christ. And what is that distinction? The nature of Christ, heavenly, pure, righteousness, godliness. The nature of Adam, all that is evil. Tell me that's not true. <laughs> We're not living from a law anymore. We're living from a nature. Christ in you, this is uh, Ephesians chapter 2, we were formerly by nature objects of wrath. You can't touch nature by throwing law at it. That's why you can't stop abortion. Or anything else. You can curtail the soul by putting the gun to somebody's head, as long as you got the gun to their head. And the law was a gun to people's head. But that didn't change their nature. And how many understand with me that God's after a little bit more than a gun to our head? He's after a bride who's living from within, out of the nature that he is within her. Amen. That's union, not with some written code. Amen. Isn't that true? How many, how many in this room want to marry a written code? I'll sell you one if you want it. I mean, you pay the... <laughs> okay. Forget I said that. <laughs> Look, <laughs> this has been said many times. If I wanted to marry someone who knew everything, I'd, write, I'd marry a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Forget I said that too. <laughs> Scratch that off. No one has any interest in marrying a book. Isn't that true? It's a person. We're in love with a person. The Lord's in love with a people, his bride. His heart is there. So see, I, I just want to keep pointing these things out to us. The nature of Christ in us has a clear, very clear, eternally clear, is that not true? Eternally clear expression. And it is not evil. Do you imagine that? That the nature of Christ would express evil? You shall know them by their fruits. Isn't that true? That's coming out of nature. That's living by the life of another. It's letting the Lord live through us. Letting the Lord manifest himself through us. Being vessels of honor. What is a vessel of honor? A vessel that is in that relationship that allows him and in, that, in and through that union to express his very nature, his very life, his essence through us as vessels. It's a vessel of honor. It's a vessel serving into the purpose in which it was created. Amen. I'm not going to get to the message yet, but this is a good message whether I ever get to the rest of it. <laughs> it is a setup, but anyway. Okay. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Brothers and sisters, honor, honor, honor unto the Lord expression of his nature expression of his nature not grumbling and complaining and it's the wrong nature but a thankful people do you agree 
it hits us all right in the heart, doesn't it? Because we're all so spoiled. I'm not being general, so don't take this personal. I'm speaking of myself, including myself when I say this. We are all so spoiled. We think God's there to give us what we want. But he's after a bride that will give him what he wants. Now these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings. Here it is again. For us. Examples and warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So Paul understood that. He lived in the revelation of that understanding. When he was able and he did not have as great an opportunity as we now have in this because the printing press had not been yet invented. But when he read the scriptures, he wrote about 13 to 14 books of the New Testament. <laughs> why did he? Why did God use him to write that much? Because of the revelation of Christ. That is the answer. But when he read the scriptures, it was with one intent. Must become our intent. Holy Spirit, take these scriptures and reveal Christ in me. If we're looking at the scriptures for any other purpose, or we're looking at proof texts to support our point, rather than the knowing of the Lord, we have missed the intent of these scriptures. If we'll ask the Holy Spirit... It will be like pouring gasoline on a fire. See, he loves to reveal the Son of God. That's why he inspired these scriptures to be written, plucking out events throughout the history of humanity. God ordained, God designed events to point to the Son of God to the need for the Son of God, to the coming of the Son of God, to the intent of God in His coming, but in glimpses and in types and in shadows because God was dealing with a people who are so local now. Their soul was in dominion over their, their spirit had been pushed down and they'd lost spiritual connection with God. And so God had to use natural events and natural things to speak. That's the only way you can speak to a soulical people. And they took those natural things and they made them everything. And they looked for natural answers and they looked for a natural future. And they missed the spiritual one who came to them. And he didn't look like they thought he should look. And he didn't act like they thought he should act. Because he didn't crush the Romans. And he didn't do what they wanted him to do. He came to crush the nature of Adam and people. To strike at the root of the issue, the nature of man. But they could not appreciate him for that. Because all they could thought was their earthly cares and their worries. And we're in the same boat again. And so God's coming to his church before he comes for his church. Amen. That's what's in front of us. That's what the shaking is about. If we're going to keep our eyes on the things of this world, God's going to shake them down right in front of us. Why? Why are they being shaken? Because they can be. Because the only thing that can't be shaken is an e internal, eternal kingdom called Christ in you. Amen. 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 That can't be shaken. Yeah, he can destroy. You can take everything we have. We have him. And you can't touch that. <laughs> Kill me, make my day. <laughs> <laughs> it's just true. What do you do with a people like that? They are reckoned over to him. They're not living for the temporal. They're living in the eternal. It's already begun for them. 
That relationship is, is that internal, eternal relationship with the Lord. They are in, you can't touch a person like this, when they're in a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord. That's what Paul talks about. Beholding the Lord as in a mirror. I look in the mirror and the Lord's looking back at me. Now that's a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord. Something that was absolutely forbidden in the Old Testament. You saw the face of the Lord, you died. Paul said, we're in one now. Christ in you. This is the superiority of the new covenant versus that first one. The first covenant is pointing to this covenant. And this covenant is the absolute of the purpose of God. Christ in you. Amen. Well, I could go on all night with that. That just goes on and on and on. We're just what we're doing is just gathering up the fragments of scriptures in the New Testament and bringing. And half the New Testament is either a direct quote or an allusion to the old anyway. Because <laughs> what are they doing there? They're gathering up the Old Testament. This is what Jesus Himself did. It's what got them so mad at Him, because He's gathering up all those things and presenting Himself. I am the I am. Deal with it. I'm the one who spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Deal with it. I'm the one who spoke into existence all that is. I spoke and it was created. That one's living in us, brothers and sisters. Satan knows it. I wonder if the church does. <laughs> we wouldn't be living lowly like this, would we, Brad? We don't understand the importance of that kingliness of life, that nature, that amazing nature that is in us, the life of Christ himself, the Lamb, the Messiah, the King, the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, whatever words you want to put, just gather up all his names, roll them into one. That's who he is. I remember an experience, if you don't mind me telling this for a second, I'm going to tell it anyway, whether you do mind or not. No, I don't tell you. I don't get to tell a lot of things. Those things the Lord let me tell. I'll tell you a little bit about it. But anyway, I remember one time uh, this chariot experience. I've had a number of them where the chariot shows up, and I just jump. I'm foolish enough to jump in, and off we go. You know, don't have any horses. <laughs> you know, it's more like Elijah's chariot. You didn't have any horses. It has a different propulsion system called the Spirit. <laughs> So off we go, and going around, flying here, there, going. We start into the blue, and we just kept going and going and going into the blue, and what felt like for days. And in the spirit, I've learned one thing: the meaning of this passage. In the spirit, time is different. It's timeless, and here's the way it operates: at times, a day, a day. 24 hour period is like a thousand years. And in time, it's the reverse. A thousand years is like a day. So went and went and went for weeks and months into the blue. It came into this place, it looked like a fog bank, it flew right into the center of it. And the, the terror of the Lord hit me. And so uh, around me, it whispers. And at the sound of thunder, the names of God, all of them, were being proclaimed around me. I could not see. At that point, I couldn't see the front part of the chariot, the thickness of the fog. There was an angel standing next to me to my left. And then suddenly, the Lord himself, as a Revelation 1 type appearance, appeared right in front of the chariot. And, I, and that's why I say this to you. It's happened to me a number of times. I didn't fall because of the power of his presence. At a cellular level, I collapsed. There was no delay. He appeared, I collapsed. Screamed. I thought I was going to die. There was pain involved in it on my physical body. And uh, he spoke exactly what he said in the book of Revelation there to me. Proclaimed himself. 
gathered up everything that's ever been written of him, spoken of him, right into himself. So finally, uh, and I hate to say it to you this way, I was thankful when he left <laughs> because of the, the terror that was on me. Awesome yet terrifying. He's way more than we've made him out to be. We brought him down to our level. We were forbidden to do that in the Old Testament. Don't make any graven images of the Lord, including those that look like men. Well, anyway, forget I said that. <laughs> Well, he disappeared, and we'd been, you know, I told you, we'd been going and going and going above the earth for days and days and weeks and months. And I've had the sensation of falling in some of these experiences before, and I don't like it. And I like roller coasters, but I don't like that. Well, anyway, so I'm, I'm uh, standing there. The Lord's disappeared. The angel's standing there. And the angel turns around to me, he's at my side, he turns around, looks at me, and forcefully takes his hand and shoves me out of the back of the chariot. And I remember my instantaneous thought was, how rude. <laughs> so I thought, my second thought was, because we've been going forever, I'm going to fall, and this is not going to be good. <laughs> I took a half a step, and in this fog, I took a half a step, my foot touched the earth. And so standing there looking around thinking, Where, how in the world did I get here? The angel, like, like some kind of a garment, he rips the fog open, pokes his head out, looks at me and says, says this. He says, the, the uh, knowledge of God is not a place. It's a person, and his name is Jesus. Anyway, just thought I'd relay that to you. <laughs> I'm telling you, this one in, in us, we've, we really don't know how to appreciate him the way he needs to be appreciated. Would you agree with me on that? I'm telling you, folks, we need to, at all times, be a thankful, thankful people. Thankful people. I believe that's what you see in Paul and others in that day. They were thankful. They'd lived under the law. They were thankful to live in Christ and Christ in them. Amen. So anyway, so I say all that to say, so when we look at Daniel, we look at Esther, and we look at Ezra, and we look at Nehemiah, and we look at Haggai, and Zechariah, and Malachi. You mustn't just look at those to be books referring back here, but understand the message of God to us and the ways of God and his desire for us. When we read, we have to ask the Lord. It's important for what I'm about to share with us. When I look, I want to hit this tonight again, when I look at the travail that was on Daniel, and here's what travail is made up of uh, one simple component, and that is the burden of the Lord. Not man's burden. God's burden is in travail. I'm saying this to us. God's interests, what God is wanting to do in the time in which we live, that burden is what God wants to release to us. His purpose, His plan, specific to this generation, that is the invitation of God to us in this hour. With it will come instruction if we will receive it. And I already can tell you already are receiving it. But I want to be as clear as I can. I, I believe this to be true. We're, so often we fail to give proper spiritual definition to what we're saying. I don't want to fail to do that. When I talk about travail, in travail, if it is to have we are to have the ministry of travail, it must have the burden of the Lord in it. All ministry begins with the burden of the Lord. 
and that we have ministry that does not have the burden of the Lord, Houston, we got a problem. It is not the burden of man that we're after here. It is not good, so-called, godly ideas. Man plans what man can organize. I'm not against organization when it's God or doing the organizing. But man always messes up. Let me tell you, man's organization can only limit God. I have never seen it in my 50-something years be other than that. This is direct, isn't it? <laughs> I know it's direct. But we've lived through it, haven't we, Brad? Haven't we, Gene? Many of us in this room have lived through that. We've seen the effects. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to say something to us. We've seen the effects and we've had enough. But it's not just good enough, or at least not good enough for us just to have had enough. I want to touch that for a second. A lot of people have had enough. But that's not God's answer. It's a step, but it's not God's full answer. God's answer is not negative. God's answer is positive. God's answer is not the negative side of it. It is the building side of it. Can you hear what I'm trying to say? It's not enough, and you'll see this in the book of Nehemiah, when he gets to Jerusalem, travail, the burden of God takes him to Jerusalem. That's where ministry begins, that the burden of God, see, the, the burden of God in that regime gets him involved. Isn't that right, Brad? Listen, brothers and sisters, God has, does not have us in Christ so that we can be on a dead-end street called do-nothing. Is that okay to share? I'm going to share it anyway. <laughs> this thing's not a dead-end street. We think it is. We're thinking wrongly. The burden of God gets, him invo gets us involved with the Lord in this. And God is a builder. And the way forward in this is build. <laughs> That's what I, Nehemiah finds out about it. Here's the distinction between Nehemiah and what we can get into the law of, it's really bad over here, and I'm out, I'm free. Of what? I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be critical here. I'm trying to point, you know, us who've seen this kind of talk and the cycles of it know that it's a dead end street if you don't get into God's burden. Is that not right? You see where I'm headed with this? Without God's burden, it's a dead end street. Nehemiah goes out at night and inspect, he inspects the condition of the wall. Him and a few others. And he sees the scattered stones. Those stones speak of the, of the believer. Scattered. Burnt. Isn't that right? That's what I'd say about the church in many instances. Scattered, burnt stones. But that Nehemiah just don't go keep weeping about it. Here's what Nehemiah says about it. He gets back and he says, let's rise up and build. Amen. There's the burden of God. God aims to do something about the condition of his church. He aims to do something. God is aiming to do something about what he's seeing, and he sees it perfectly clear. He's been seeing it perfectly clear. And so what has to rise up in us is that arising of the Lord's burden. And I'm telling you, when the Lord's burden is on you, you don't live the same. Why is that? Because your own, my own self-interests are dealt with by the burden of the Lord. No longer is it my own self-interest that's in the way of everything anymore. It is the interests of God that I am carrying. And I tell you, there's a weightiness to that. It's called travail. You find yourself at all times when the Lord wants it to be so. It's in His hands. But you find that burden of the Lord upon you. I am not okay with things being as they are. I'm not okay with scattered stones. I'm not okay with burned stones. I'm not okay with the bride not being who she's meant to be. Can you hear what I'm saying? I'm not okay with the house of the Lord not built and completed. If you're dealing with Ezra, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with mixture among God's people. I'm not okay with that. God's not okay with that. That's his burden. 
God's going to have it the way he originally intended for it to be. And he's been working persistently under that one single purpose for all history. Now, there's a burden to that in the Lord. It's called his. Travail has its beginning there. That's why the weeping. God does not have his heart in this matter. His fullness is not in this. I tell you what, Brad, in this, we will never be satisfied without his fullness. This thing is meant to progress, not dial down to some low estate. Not get trapped in today and forget that there's a new day and every day is new with him. There's a progression of increase and a decrease. There's a cycle to this, and it is an upward cycle, not a downward spiral. Amen. So we understand then. These men and women that we read about here are carrying the burden of the Lord. And it's going to be uncomfortable, and it's going to look foolish. And everybody else is having a gay old time. Not Daniel. Nobody else is in the lion's den but him and the Lord. Because he's in the Lord, with the Lord. The Lord's burden is on him. That's why the Lord's in him and with him. That's why the Lord makes the comments he does with him. Same kind of comment he's going to make it about Job. I have no one like him in the earth. That's what he says about Job. Comes to Daniel. <laughs> this one Gabriel sent to him. You are highly esteemed. Because this man, I'm just looking at it here. Here's the bride, though, in view. This one has the heart burden of God. They're carrying it. They are yoked with him in it. They're united with him in this. In the oneness of his purpose. I gotta, you have to see this. God's purpose, his original intention, is what he's been working to bring forth all in all of time. We understand that. It's not generic, it's not general, it's specific. To him to have a testimony of himself in this world. Now that's the uh, miniature of it. The magnitudes and the eternities. And the heavenlies. God's working unto that. And his eyes are gazing to and fro throughout the earth looking for people. Listen to this. Here's the bride whose heart is made perfect. Isn't he? He's looking. He's looking for a man. That's not a gender again. Who will stand in the gap. Become a wall because the wall is broken down. I tell you, he's looking for the new man, the corporate man. Looking for his bride in this. Can you feel that tug of the Holy Spirit on our hearts in this? Can you feel the Holy Spirit? Will you stand with me in his burden? I will give you his burden. I will release travail. I will give you the very burden of the Lord if you ask. The burden of the Lord will bring my people to do some things. It will bring my people out of spiritual captivity. Bring them out from under Babylonian rule, out from under the government of Babylon. The burden of the Lord is going to lead my people out of their present condition. There's going to be an increase of me and a decrease of them that's going to go on in this. I'm going to rise within them and shine. My glory will be in them. My very presence, my very life, my very nature will be in them. This one will be mine. She shall be joined to me. Amen. Amen. It's a union, isn't it? The sharing of one life, his life together. So, 
the bringing of the people out of spiritual captivity, out of those bondages. Listen, including in that captivity is their success in Babylon to bring them out of it. But we built our homes in Babylon. It's all we've never known. That's what the children could say who went there. All we've ever known is Babylon. We grew up in Babylon. It's uncomfortable to think that there's something better because we've grown up here. We've never known anything else. And it spells risk, doesn't it? There's risk involved in this. We're exchanging here Babylon for something else. What is that something else? We have to give clear definition to this. God's burden is unto that, unto his kingdom, unto his bride, unto his house, unto his government, unto his purpose. Established in us, therefore established in this earth. Amen? So we see that, and we see a man, we see Daniel who's willing to join with the Lord in his burden. Daniel would never physically leave Babylon, but he never was of Babylon to begin with. And he's carrying the burden of the Lord, and this thing is going to begin for the body of Christ. I'm just saying this to you. This thing is going to begin for the people who are willing. It's going to begin with us in Babylon. But God bringing us out. That's where it's going to begin. It did with Daniel. The burden of the Lord is going to be upon us. And we're surrounded by Babylon. God said, come out. My burden is to bring my people to me. A people called by my name. To gather them in the gathering place of the Father. This is the New Testament. Into the Father's house, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is its definition. That's what John would write about that. He came, he came and tabernacled. There's the tabernacle of God. He came and tabernacled among men. There's our tabernacle, the Lord. And that's what it means to be in Christ, in God's tabernacle, Christ. That's what that old tabernacle represented, didn't it? It was mobile. What was it covered with? Flesh, the skins of animals, the type of Christ. That's where the Shekinah was, veiled in the flesh. Emmanuel, God is with you. They carried that thing around through the wilderness. <laughs> the cloud moved, they moved with it. Well, that's, that's called journeys in the Lord, isn't it? Where his burden is, that's where we're at. Where his purpose is, that's where we're at. We're one. We're united with him. Anyway, I don't get lost in all that. I just want to see. It comes to Esther, saying she's carrying the burden of the Lord. God's people are at risk of death and annihilation. The burden of the Lord is upon Esther. Something has got to be done. That's that burden of God. This has got to be stopped. And if I die, my life, here's what Paul would write in the New Testament about the apostles. We are the expendable ones for your sakes. We'd say to the Corinthian church, the most carnally minded church in the New Testament. See, we can't catch this, folks. I'm just going to have to pause here and say this to us. We want to run many times when God wants us to stand. Tell me that's not true. God looked for a man among them. A man of God, a woman of God. who's not interested in running. Death is preferable to saving themselves. That's why we run. Save ourselves. Isn't it? I'm really going for it tonight, aren't I? <laughs> That's why we run. We've got our own interests in view. God has his interests. And he's looking for a man, a woman, a corporate man, a corporate woman, the bride, that will have his burden in this hour. And she will not move unless the cloud moves.
God give us that God fortitude. That's a fruit of his spirit too. Fortitude. Stand. Paul would say it. Look, God has exhibited us as apostles as last in the parade. We are exhibited, this was the way they did that in that day, as men condemned to death. Still want to sign up to be an apostle? You can't sign up to be an apostle. Your life is not your own. You're expendable. You go into it knowing that. How is that? Because that's the nature of the Lamb operating. Paul would say to the most carnal-minded church in the New Testament, we're given over to death so that life can work in you. That's the nature of the Lamb of God. Why are we here? We're here to rule. No, we're not. We're here to die. That's the way true leadership operates. Follow me as I follow Christ. He's a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's that nature. And we've elevated leadership, a form of leadership that is Babylonian in nature. Make a name for yourself. That's what we've done. Just tell me that's not true. God doesn't, underst God doesn't understand why we're so attached to that thing. He does understand because he understands the na human nature. But his own people? Why is that so hard to let go of, to make a name for ourselves? I'm not interested in making a splash in a natural sense because that's all it will be is a splash. Eternity won't be in it. I've had the Lord stand in front of me, looking at me right eyeball to eyeball, and an uncomfortable this was on me. You know, and I didn't say it. I didn't have to. I thought it. What are you looking at? I'm looking for the measure of my son in you. Lord, help us. Heaven has an entirely other than, it's not of this earth, entirely other than measurement of success. That's why they're told in the Old Testament to measure the temple of God. All of that is a reference. Paul understands it's why he writes what he does in the book of Ephesians. He uses the word measurement. He knew about the tabernacle. It was the pattern that God had given to Moses. And he said, build it exactly according to the pattern, the measure. I'm not coming from a surveyor, civil engineering line. I understand the need for accuracy. <laughs> Otherwise, you get shot by landowners. <laughs> Isn't that right, Gene? You know, or you build the building over on the wrong side. Understand the need for proper measurement, exact measurement. But what is in view there, Paul understands the measure of Christ. Everything is measured by the measure of Christ. He is the true tabernacle. He is the temple of God. And so are we. Anyway, just thought I'd say that to us. So God's ready in our time. I'm going to close down here. We can pick this back up tomorrow night and go on with it. But God is ready to release his burden to a people who consider his burden precious. To a people who are done with their own interests. That his interests have captured our hearts. His burden is on us, in us, from him. And our interest is not our own things and our own little kingdoms and making a name for ourselves. But instead, that whether by life or death, his name would be exalted in and through us as people. That he would, we would ensure this, if by necessary our death spread, we would ensure that he has a people of his name. We're given over to him and his burden to be expendable in that. 
That's the spirit of the Lord in Daniel and in Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah. They understood something. It's something the Lord said to me years ago. Terry, do you understand? It's what Paul would write in Colossians chapter 1. I fill up in my body the sufferings of the Lord Jesus that are lacking for his church. I sat at a table, and 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 it was a round table, in a council of the Lord meeting. The Lord talking to me about that scripture. Do you understand in each successive generation of man, there is the demand for those who enter in to the sufferings of Christ so that God's full burden, His intent, His purpose may be established in His people. I wept because I didn't understand that from that scripture. That travail, that burden, in Colossians again, is upon Paul. You see it there in Colossians chapter 1. But we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching every man, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Here's the travail word when you look at it in the Greek. To this end I strive, it means travail, to this end. To this end I strive, laboring, travail, with all his energy that so powerfully works in me. That is the burden of the Lord operating through the apostle. Look at it in Galatians chapter 4 verse number 9. I am in travail again until Christ be formed in you. There is no ministry without the burden of the Lord. There never has been. That's right, Gene. Not real ministry. Not as heaven sees it. That's what the Lord's told many of us. He said it to me. What I don't initiate, I don't appreciate. Romans 11 will say that to us. It's from him. It's through him. And it's to him. The glory is. To God be the glory. I know this is true of you guys. That's what we're, I just want us to be clear. What we're saying yes to is him, his burden. That's what we're saying yes to. We're saying it is a it is a line of demarcation. God bring it right here to our hearts. A demarcation from this, my own self interests, and the domination of my self interests, to the interests, to the burden of the Lord. We'll never be the same. Because we'll never be okay again with God not having what he wants. You with me in that? I'm not okay. On a day-to-day basis, I'm not okay. I don't go around moping. I'm telling you within, I am not okay. I don't want to be okay. And I've told the Lord that directly. I don't want to be okay. You don't have what you want. How can I be okay? He loves me. That isn't the issue in this. This is his burden. It's his heart. That's what he's after with the people. And it grows. It starts in seed form and he grows it and he grows it and he grows it. And at times it's like it will overwhelm us. The Lord Jesus sweat drops of blood over this issue. To the birthing, to the establishing of what God wants. What his father wanted. He was expendable. He had to be. He came with that intent. For this reason I came into the world. Why are we here? What does it mean for such a time as this? To expend our lives on our self-interests? Have we had enough of that? I've had enough of that. 
I am done with it. Forever. I've had enough of that. Self-centered living. Living for ourselves. Done with that. Pastor Brad said, I've got a, I've got a closet full of t-shirts. Been there, done that. Got t-shirts for it. Worn them at times. And got a closet full of skeletons too. From those t-shirts. <laughs> Giving my heart to other things of God rather than the God of all things. No more. I'm done with it. I'm not interested in just living my life before the Lord alone in that sense. I'm interested in being one with Him and having His burden. And if the demand is by life or death, I am expendable before Him unto that end that he may establish all that has been eternally in his mind and in his heart. And I believe this wholeheartedly, that he's looking for people who will say yes to him along those lines specifically, not generically and not generally. What will it cost you, Terry? Everything. This is not about what I gain. It's about who... He is and what He is meant to gain for the sake of His name. You with me in that? So I'm not okay. I'm not, I don't plan to be okay before I die. Up until that final, whenever that moment is. For me, it's even so come, Lord, quickly. <laughs> but I don't plan to be okay. I don't want to be okay. I want the disruption of the Lord. Can you say amen to that one? Can you say even so be it? With me, Lord, I want the disruption of the Lord. I'm asking for it on a regular basis in my times before Him and pouring my heart out before Him in the secret place and in the private place where there is no man and there are no other eyes but the eyes of the Lord. My cry is such that I not be okay. And that these things hold no weight. These natural things have no weight upon my heart, but that the burden of the Lord be the weight upon my heart. So I call us unto that tonight, knowing that you've already been saying yes, but I, I believe in defining it as clearly, and it's in as clearly as it can be, but as clearly as I can make it before us, to call us to that place in this hour. Listen, brothers and sisters, can you feel this? The weight of our times and understanding the times that we're living in and the weight of these times. And it is weighty, isn't it? Things are going from bad to worse in the natural. And will a people arise in this hour unto the Lord and the Lord arise in them? That were created, were brought into this moment for such a time as this, created for this hour. Until the ultimate dedication, I am yours. I'm expendable in this. If by life or death you can establish your purpose, I am with you in this, Lord. May the nature of, of the Lamb Himself be mine, established in me. In such a people, though it may seem small and insignificant, to the realm of darkness and to the world. It doesn't take many. It just takes a few Gideons. It just takes a Daniel. It just takes an Esther. I want to encourage you in this. Say, I fell alone. Well, so did Esther. But she wasn't. She had Mordecai, a type of the Holy Spirit. The Lord's in us. We have one another. That's the beautiful thing about the bride. You're not alone. And this isn't in that sense like the Old Testament. They were other than the Lord. Daniel was alone. But his decisions brought forth Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So realize that. That dedication will cause others to follow. Amen? But we're in a new time, in a new era, in a new covenant. And I know this and you know this. There are many of us spread out, what's known as the body of Christ, who will never be satisfied with the crumbs from the table. Ever. It is fullness or nothing. 
Understanding the cost and understanding the dedication necessary under that. It isn't even a question. Lord, here am I. Send me. That's what I believe the Holy Spirit is calling us to. The great burden of the Lord. And so again tonight, I'm going to just simply ask. You just stay seated. Unless you want to stand. Yeah, do what you want to do in that, but you don't have to stand. I simply ask for the burden of the Lord unto the travail that it will bring forth. In seed form, Lord, there is good soil in the hearts of your people here tonight. And in good soil, even the smallest seed will become the largest tree in the garden and dominate the garden. That's who you are, Jesus. The eternal seed that crushes the head of the serpent. We're under, and that be the best way of saying this, but we're under the wings. We're under his wings right now. We receive, Lord. And this moment, your burden, we receive your burden, Lord. Our hearts, Lord, turn to you and you alone. Lord, you are the reason to be here now upon this earth. We present ourselves holy to you, Lord to be that holy people. Wholeheartedly we present ourselves. To the receiving of your burden. And over the next days and weeks, months, Holy Spirit, we ask you to continue to define and redefine your burden, your purpose, your intent. But Lord, we stand with you tonight. And Lord, we say yes. I just feel like we need to blow the shofar if that's possible. We could do that. I should have said something to you before. I'm sorry. You just go for it. Do whatever the Lord leads you to do.
just respond to the Lord, brothers and sisters. Lord, we're yours in this moment and in every moment. This moment marks a new beginning for us, Lord. We are your people, a people called by your name. We say yes. Or this shofar says back to you from us that we're a people awakened, a people ready, a people saying yes, a people that are not our own. We are yours. We're coming out and we're going on with you, Lord. Your people. Yes, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord, to your intent, to your burden, to your purpose, to your fullness. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, all oh, that's in your heart that we don't even know anything about. But yes, Lord, nonetheless. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, we will stand and not run. We do not have the option, nor do we want it, of our own choice in this. Our own will in this. It is your will that we're after. It's your intent. And it's your purpose. We choose that, Lord. Joined completely with you. A people of your own possession. A royal, eternal priesthood. A kingly priesthood. That's who you've prepared us to be as a bride, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Lord, here in this area, there's a people, your people, and your name must be reckoned with now by the enemy in a way as never before. There's a confrontation and a conflict. There's an enlargement of your ground and your sphere and your influence and your purpose and your intent. There's a progression. There's an advance unto fullness. I thank you, Lord, for that which you have already begun. And that, Lord, this is a time of enlargement and advancement. Both on this earth and in the heavens. In the heavenlies. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing tonight. What you've been doing. We bless you, Lord. We will never say no to you, Lord. Only yes.